Well, thanks so much, Pastor Levi, for giving me a bit of time today. And that you're probably inundated with interviews and online stuff. So uh, I do, I really appreciate uh, you taking some time. It's a privilege. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. So my first, yeah. que- my first question is, to what degree does the crushing that we experience equate to the anointing that we receive? Yeah, I think that the two can't be separated, you know, because the Gethsemane prepares us for Calvary. And Gethsemane is the place of crushing and Calvary is the place of our primary contribution, you know, in the sense that we're called to all pick up our cross. So, you know, we're to see ourselves in, in, in miniature of what Christ did in, in macro. And so what he did for us was he was willing to go to Gethsemane and, and he faced the pressing on his way to the Calvary, which was his hour. So all of us have to some degree or other an hour. When Ananias was told to go and pray for Paul that he might receive his vision, one of the things that God said is, um, he is my appointed vessel to bring the gospel to kings, Gentiles, and the nation of Israel. And I will tell him how many things he must suffer for my name. And I think that those two sides are, are the two sides of the same coin. The, the things God wants to do through Paul and, and the pain that Paul has to face. Wow. On one hand, it's misery, how many things he must suffer for my name. And the other side is the ministry, bearing the gospel to the kings, Gentiles, and the children of Israel. Cool. And I think that a lot of us would love to have the ministry without the misery. But if you take away the cost, you also take away the calling. And so I think we all have to, to some degree or, or another, um, face up to the cross we must carry on the way to the calling that we have to, um, you know, that we have the privilege of, of, of being able to be called to. Mm. The first interview we did, Bishop T.D. Jake said, anyone that's in a place of influence, they're there for a reason. And as I reflect on all the people I've interviewed, the one common denominator has been suffering. And I know this is a heavy topic. Uh, we'll get onto lighter things, but people are suffering at the moment, Pastor Levi. We're in the midst of a global pandemic. This pandemic is no respecter of persons. And people are grieving, suffering, going through their own pain and trauma. In the midst of these emotions, how can people intentionally lead themselves well internally? as well as lead others well externally. Yeah, so I think um, for me, uh, I'm never at my best leading others unless I'm successful in leading myself. And uh, so I've had to take some time to really explore what is it about my day-to-day schedule that helps me to be at my best and how do I best lead myself? So I think that personality plays a lot into that. Um, personal health plays a lot physically I, I'm not doing well so even today within my house not not at the gym like I would like to be I took the time to do some some workouts if I'm if I'm um, uh, spending time with Jesus before I talk to anybody if I am doing those sorts of things my eating like I a lot of I know a lot of people have been like talking about the quarantine you know um, weight they've been putting on or whatever it's like I know for me if i'm not eating well i'm not feeling well i'm not leading well so Mm -hmm. sticking to my diet those are little things that i can do to be at my best personally that i can then lead our organization corporately so i think what you have to do is figure out what it takes for you to suit up you know to, to get your uniform on so that you can be your best when you show up and uh so that's been uh, a journey for me as a leader, but I think it's really important and crucial that you, you do what Socrates said and you have to know yourself. That's wonderful. And obviously the two extremes is people advocating extreme production. And then on the other stream, people are focused on consumption, just the, the news on all the time, just focusing on the death toll, all the negativity. Uh, can you give us some practical handles? You've kind of mentioned a couple, but how we can be productive in this time when we've got limitations? Well, I mean, that's, that's a, my, my problem is the exact opposite. I would describe myself by nature as a productivity addict. You know, I, um, like my self-worth rides and falls based on productivity. 
So if I'm not well, that's a massive idol for me. Mm -hmm. So like I do, therefore I am. And I have to stop that. You know, I have to come back to like, no, I am, my value comes from my, my being made in the image of God. My value comes from being entrusted with his spirit. The things that I do do not define who I am. So um, I have to back that off. And I think a part of me um, has to, uh watch out for that and so leaning into this things like the sabbath have been really helpful for me the discipline and duty of taking that day out of seven and saying i'm not going to generate anything my wife and i had to come to a place like we're not going to clean out the garage or garage on a saturday you know we're not going to do anything that gives us a meaningful sense of a checkbox on on those days and those sorts of things that remind me that it's the work jesus did that i rest in Yes. And so starting off the new week in, in worship, having already rested, it, th those are little things for me that have, have been really helpful for me. And that's really, really helpful. Obviously, we're going to be in a season where we're forced to be in an environment with people that might necessarily be life-giving just because their family doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna, their voice is going to be fruitful f for us. How, how do you determine and discern who's in your inner circle and who's in the kind of periphery, outer periphery? How, how do you decide that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, when you find yourself triggered regularly by someone, I think, uh, you know, you've, and you've, you've, you've sought God enough to know, like, is this my flesh or is this me? I think um, who sharpens iron, right? I mean, that's what Proverbs says, as a man, as a man is kept, enhances the countenance of his friends so iron sharpens iron i think um who, who makes you more like jesus who makes you want to be like jesus i think you have to you know it's it's really easy to only want people in your audience to tell you what you want to hear but i think some of my favorite people in my life are those who tell me things that i need to hear and yeah. sparks don't fly when things are smoothly rubbing it's the friction and so i think you know the the block button is important on Instagram to be able to block some people. But I think it's also important that you have people who are willing lovingly to tell you things to your face, not behind your back that you need to hear. Beautiful. And a gift, many gifts you have Pastor Levi, but one is you, your, I mean, I would call it an Elisha anointing in the sense you, you have some Elijah's in your life that, uh, really advocate you really champion you and you just got those really strong uh relationships if there's someone watching this maybe a leader that's looking for a mentor or looking for someone to speak into their life is it an organic process was it an organic process for you or is it something that people should intentionally pursue i think both i think um you should not let a lack of connectivity keep you back from apprentice type relationships. You know, I'm really grateful right now for like, for example, Pastor Louis Giglio and Pastor Craig Rochelle. They're yeah. definitely mentors for me that I'm in close proximity to, but I learned from them for years when they had no idea who I was, no idea. I mean, I would watch their sermons, study their moves, listen to their, their, their podcast or, you know, whatever it was like almost to a degree of like, uh, borderline stalking, you know, and I never tried to reach out to their offices and make anything happen. Never tried to put myself out there. Hey, would you mentor me? I don't, I don't have to know you to learn from you. I can do that from across the country or world. So I was doing that for years. And then one day God opened the doors. And the Bible says that God can open doors that no one can shut and God can shut doors that no one can open. And I never, I mean, I went to an event Pastor Craig did in Seattle. Um, uh, and stood in his line, you know, to his book signing line, and uh, got him to sign a book and just thanked him. Didn't, didn't say anything about, hey, will you mentor me? Just said thank you, you know? I think um, God has a way of opening up these opportunities. And, and then years later, I met him at another event, and he was like, oh, hey, we should, you know, da -da -da talk and change, change, exchange numbers. And I don't think he remembered. I, I didn't tell him until years later, we had already met once before, you know? But um, I think, you don't have to let the fact that you don't know someone keep you from learning from someone. You can pick a mentor without ever having access to them. And then, you know, down the road, God opens up those opportunities. Great. You walk through them. So I, I would say it's a balance of that. And then I would also say like, um, 
you know, there is a weird way to where you could put the onus on someone else to mentor you, you know, but I think empowerment starts with yourself. You can empower yourself to learn from someone and, and try it in a way that makes it easy for them. Like I've always tried to add value to those who are in a relationship above me, not tried to put that on them. Like they need to disciple me. Yeah. Yes. I try to give them permission to speak into my life if they see something, but I don't want it to be like a, a thing where they dread my name showing up on their caller ID, but I'm actually adding value and blessing them and encouraging them too. I love that. So you're not draining them. You're, you're actually adding value to what, to what they do. That, that's amazing. Obviously you're, you're exposed to these great leaders. Uh, what would you say maybe two or three principles, life principles that they live out daily that makes them great leaders? Yeah, I would say for our, okay, so like just for a couple different people, like for Pastor Stephen Furtick, I would say he's nonstop. He is, he is nonstop. I mean, if you're working out with him, if you're hanging out with him, he is fully focused, fully intense. Uh, you know, like Paul said, you know, I forget everything behind me and go towards it. I, I think for Pastor Stephen, it is every ounce of his being is poured into his leadership and preaching. Everything. I mean, he leaves it out. They, they would say that, um, um, uh, trying to think of, oh, Bruce Springsteen. I guess if you saw Bruce Springsteen at the end of a, of a concert, he would be a puddle because he would put everything on the puddle. And I feel like Pastor Stephen preaches like that. That's what I would take away from him. Um, I would say with Pastor Craig, there's not a more efficient human being on the planet. You know, he, calc he doesn't put his pants on without thinking through the impact of left leg, right leg. You know, everything is very thought out, very methodical. There's not a more efficient human being financially, you know, mentally, preparation wise than Pastor Craig Groeschel. Um, And then with Pastor Louie, um, I would say it's intentionality and design, everything carefully crafted environment wise, set list, pr prayer, um, he, he just thinks, thinks everything through in a very creative way. And so, and, and really, and none of those three are like each other in a lot of ways, but all three of them are like each other in that what they're doing, they're uniquely doing. You know, they all, they've all found their lane. They know why God put, has put them on the earth. They're not ducks trying to, you know, climb trees, but they're really good at the unique thing in which they're called to do. So I would say too, you know, it's that it's given me permission to find my own unique uh, sound and to play it loud, you know, and to, to discover my, who, what's my core competency, you know? That's amazing. And, you know, there's this whole area of prayer that I do want to go into because cause there's often a, often we can't give language to the balance of how much is prayer and resting in grace and how much is us working to push something through taking the kingdom by force. The question's twofold. Would love just to look behind the, the veil, so to speak, and you to share some of your prayer rhythm. And then how important is, is prayer to ministry? Yeah. Wow. Well, good. I mean, I think it's, um, it's, it's everything, you know, Roman, my, my big thoughts on prayer come from Romans eight groanings that can't be uttered, you know, believing that the Holy spirit um, inside you strives earnestly and, and gives groanings that can't be uttered. You know, the, the, the world's groaning to be redeemed. Ourselves are groaning to be restored and the spirit's groaning in us. So I think as we participate in prayer, we're participating in that symphony of groaning and um, you know, I have, certain prayers I pray regularly you know I have a certain amount of prayers that I always pray before I preach they're kind of crafted prayers that guide my mind they're meditation type prayers um, among them you know prayers that I would preach with clarity conviction and passion that I preach for the first as though for the first time and like I would if I knew it was going to be the last time that in my weakness his strength is made perfect and that the weaker I become the stronger I am so like there's certain prayers that I would pray regularly the same prayers um i found great strength in praying the lord's prayer you know um and praying that through methodically um there is i think great help in prayer walks so i regularly take walks and pray and then i also uh keep a journal that i write in every day and i would have written out prayers things i'm struggling with failures you know uh so my rhythms uh 
I'm, I'm a creature of habit. So if I do something, it's, it's definitely going to get set into a motion. So I also try and sometimes mix it up, uh, adding prayer time on my knees, adding prayer time with my wife together. Mm-hmm. We pray, you know, sporadically together apart alone, you know, all consistently. And, and then we try and pray as a family, you know, as well, not just at mealtime, but, you know, whether it's bedtime or we, we've been rereading through Narnia together, little things like that. I think uh, just really, you know, getting into, uh, in a good way, a routine. Yeah, I love that. And an element of prayer, it, we, we, we hear the voice of God, but we also have a, have a discernment within us as well. Um, in ministry, you need a level, a degree and dimension of, of discernment. Uh, how does that play out when you're leading your church got a great church in montana uh how does that play out in your spiritual walk and leadership yeah i think discernment is huge i think um it's one of the most important underrated things that it's really challenging to teach people how how to use discernment on on everything how to hear, hear how to hear god's will and um you know whether it's a staffing thing you know hiring people uh whether it's knowing when to when to let people go you know, new, new moves as a, that is, that is, that is incredibly vital and essential. And I think, uh, there's probably n- nothing more important than really truly, um, learning the art and the experimentation with hearing God's voice. And, you know, it, it is more of a journey than it is a science, right? I mean, it's not like you can ever empirically say, this is it. I mean, even when you look at the book of Acts, I think you see Paul trying trying to figure it out. I tried to go to Asia, ended up in Macedonia, heard a dream about a guy from Troas, got kicked out of this synagogue, ended up in a prison ship, got to Rome via chains. Yeah. So I think it is, it is something where, you know, at our best, we're 70% sure this is God's will and we're just going to give it a shot and I guess we'll find out. And I think at the end of the day, you, you discover more in the rearview mirror than anything, whether you're right or wrong. Wow. Well, Dr. Henry Cloud, in our interview this week, talked about uh, his book, uh, Necessary Endings, and said, oftentimes uh, we experience new seasons like their old seasons because we enter into these new seasons without cutting off Goliath's head, so to speak, after we've hurled him down with a rock. So my next question is, how do we lead... Uh, with the balance of our head and our heart, your, your head might know it's time to lose a staff member, yet your heart really loves them and loves their family and they've served you faithfully. Like, like what, what's the balance between head and heart? That's a great question. Yeah, I think um, uh, I heard Ken Costa, my friend from England, he said once that, uh, uh, you know, you can't look for this season's birds and last season's nests, you know? And so I think you do have to know when a season has come to an end and yeah. when it's time to, um, you know, no longer cling to a Saul that God's rejected because now it's time to find David. And that's really hard. And the loyalty piece is hard. I'm a loyal person by nature. And if people have been loyal, it's, it's very hard and challenging to see that come to a, a conclusion. And I think that's one of the reasons it's so important to, to slow down the hiring process, you know, to make sure people are a cultural fit because it's really unfair to people to hire them for a job they're not suited for. And so we've really tried to, you know, to, to build systems that, and Patrick Lencioni's work has really been helpful for us in figuring those sorts of things out. One of the things that made a big um, difference was really nailing down our cultural values as a staff. We've always had, you know, culture as, a, as an organization for the whole church, our mission statement and our values. But when we took the time to really nail down the things that we think would make the blend, really, of because of, it's not any one thing, you know, because humility is on that list. Well, there's lots of humble people who don't have drive. Yeah. A driven person. There's lots of driven people who don't have humility. But when you talk about a driven, humble person, okay. Sorry, that was R two D two. A driven that. person is a unique find. Okay, well now, then you also take driven, humble, comfort, comfortable in their own skin, and uh, uh, fun loving. 
and, you know what I mean? And you start to really correctable, a coachable person. Okay, well, hold on a second. So now I'm looking for a coachable, driven, humble, fun-loving, comfortable in their own skin. Now I understand what this job entails. And as we really nail down people, and a lot of, a big, the big thing about the art of an interview is the art of the second question. Because if I say to you, um, you know, do, do you love, uh, are you coachable? You'd go, well, well, yeah, I am. Okay, great. Tell me an example of a time that you re recently received coaching. Now, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, 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 you know what I mean? So the, 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 it's the second question. You know, a lot, of, a lot of interviews, I think, don't go deep enough. And when you ask that second question, well, show me an example. Tell me a time. Who can I call that would tell me, you know, of a time that you received coaching well? And now, all of a sudden, we're going to start to get to a deeper level. And so for us, the better we've done on the front end, the, le the less painful it's been on the back end. Because we've done a better job of maybe not hiring who will eventually become a cultural misfit. The hard thing is when you're trying to hire, you just want a warm body in there to, to do something. And uh, then down the road, you're like, ah, this person, it's like a dead weight. Well, they never, they never, they were a great volunteer, but they weren't meant to be a staff member. And I think that's a huge difference. The person who's just going to be a tremendous volunteer is different than the person who's got a calling on their life to, to take this position. I love that. that. There's a message title there, the second question. There's a leadership teaching there. I look forward to hearing you, you bring it out. <laughs> there you go. We'll work on that. It's amazing. Um, this, this is more of a, it's not a challenge, so to speak. It's more of an observation about contemporary church. And I've been in churches where I've gone through seven or eight different personality tests and exercises to make sure that I fit the role of the church. My question's around this area of, of excellence. Do you have to be excellent at something in today's day and age to work for a church that God's really blessing? Because I don't think we'd verbalize this so candidly, but there are some individuals on this planet that aren't exceptional, that aren't driven at a particular gifting. They, they have God's value. I'm not saying they don't, but, but they're not excellent at what they do. What, what's the role for them in the church? Well, I think I, I, I would answer that with the question I was just saying. Like, there are some people who um, are, are meant to be, they're, they're meant to be a great volunteer. They're, 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 we're going to encourage them in the marketplace. They're going to, you know, yeah. make a difference and hopefully occupy their space. But, but I really do think we're looking for, you know, David's 300. You know, I think we're looking for uh, those who are, are not, are not going to walk away until it's done. And some people don't have that fire behind their eyes. And I think Spurgeon, uh, I'm just quoting only British people today. Thanks. Uh, Spurgeon said <laughs> in lectures to my students, you know, if you can do anything else besides ministry, go do it. Yeah. If you can be a banker, if you can be a lawyer, great. Because this thing's hard, you know, and we need the Navy SEALs. You know, we need the, we need the people who aren't going to ring that bell, you know, and, and, and quit when it's tough. So I, I think we are looking for people. Uh, who don't walk away. I, I, I gave a talk to our staff a while back called quit trying so hard and get something done. You know, I think uh, trying, I, was, I tried or I made five phone calls or I Googled it 12 times. Like, I don't, I don't actually care what you had to do. Show me, show me that you got it done. Show me that you finished. Show me that you delivered. Show me that you shipped. You know, and I think it's, there's a lot of people, God bless them, that have sweetheart, like, there, there are certain things you're not allowed to say in my office if you work here. You're never allowed to say, well, I really like him. Well, I'm sure you do. I'm gr he's great. He's made in the image of God. Of course you like him. I, I could care less if you like him. Tell me what his aptitude is. Tell me what his abilities are. Tell me, you know what I mean? So just, it's just, I think this pablum of like, oh, he's really nice and every, everyone really loves him. Like, that's great. Brother John is fantastic. We'll get him to serve on the greeting team and he can hand out the worship experience guides. He can be in the chat during our next online worship experience. I, for, I, for all I care, he might be the nicest human being who's, who's ever lived. Is he a player? Can he deliver? That's what I'm looking for. Love that. It flows into my penultimate question, Pastor Levi. Mi ministerial output versus outcome. How, obviously, quantifiables can be tricky in ministry. How, how do we determine not just the output where we've been productive, but like, the fruit, the outcome of our endeavors? Like, how do you measure that with your church? 
and it'll be different for every church, but like, it'll give us an indication of, of what we maybe should be looking at. That's a tension, you know, and I will say personality does play into how I'm going to answer this because I've already admitted to you that I'm a recovering, you know, productivity aholic. Yeah. Uh, I talked, I was in an interview the other day and I told someone admittedly like productivity is a, a bit of a heroine to me. Uh, but I feel like Paul was the same way. Did, Paul didn't mess around, man. You, you bounce on Paul's mission trip. You're not getting invited on the next one. You know, it's like, sorry, John Mark, you can go cry with your mom in the corner. I'm going to get something done with, you know, with, 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 with Silas. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and Barnabas be damned. You know what I mean? But but at the same time, you saw Paul at the end of his life come around to it and soften on some of that and t send John Mark because he's useful, right? Sure. And so I feel like we have to sort of balance the teaching of the parables, which Jesus was very clear that we're meant to be shrewd in the kingdom. You know, we're meant to, um, uh, you know, bring a return on investment. We're meant to cut the, the, the prune the trees back that didn't grow and get rid of the tree. I'll give it one more season. But man, I've come to you looking for fruit. I've dug around it and you can, you can do your little fertilization thing. But if I come back again, so help me. And there's not some fruit on that tree. We're ripping that tree out. Cause I, life is short. John nine, the night is coming when no one can work. We're not messing around here. So I do want you to track analytics. I I want, I want to know that you've ran two Facebook ads and seen which one, you know, performed better and that you, you did that due diligence. That you're not bringing, you know, some, uh, plan in here that has not met a simulated contact with the enemy on your own time. I, uh, you know, do your research. You, you work that crap out. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to hear it because night is coming. But then we also have to balance that with the fact that there are certain things about this, the kingdom, this upside down kingdom that are not the way that mankind works. You know, there's not, you can't just say quantifiably, is this better or worse? There are some things in which God's ways are not our ways. So I think there's always going to be a tension there and that we can't write people off too soon, you know, and, and I think we always have to live in that space in between, right? Mm. Brilliant. R real wisdom there. Uh, in a moment, Pastor Levi, I would love you to pray for our audience and let us know how we can find out more about you, your ministry, church, etc. But final question, if someone had the opportunity to sit down for a coffee with you for an hour and just chat with you, what, what would you really, obviously again, it's going to depend on personality and context, but if there was one big theme that you thought every person needed to know, like, like what would it be? Well, I mean, over coffee, I'd want to hear their story, hear their journey, you know, the pain. I think the, the commonality is that we've all gone through pain. I mean, hearing you, uh, talk about some of the hard things you've been through. I, I would probably focus on that. You know, what's, what's, what's lighting you up in a, in a beautiful way and, and, and fan the flame. I, th I do think everybody's got a passion. I think everybody, you know, whether it's ministry or not, I think, I think a lot of people are not called into what we would call ministry. They're actually called to something better. And that's, you know, shining their light in the secular space and the marketplace. I think, um, I think there's a, a, a massive, massive, a giant ready to be wakened in the church, seeing themselves on mission in banking, in art, in Hollywood, in science. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a history buff. So I love, 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 love history. I've, I've been doing deep dives in this quarantine on Winston Churchill. Uh, yeah. I've been, I've been glutting myself in the, the stories of Britain during the Blitz and all that, I love it. I think there's a lot to learn, I, and, I, and it puts a lot in perspective. You know, this seems bad, this quarantine, but it's like, yeah, but there's not bombs dropping on our head. And there's not, you know, Hitler trying to destroy the whole world while the Japanese empire tries to light the Pacific on fire. You know, so it's like, I think when we look into the past, it does inform a little bit of a temperate, uh, way of responding to the future. But I would say I would, if I was sitting down with someone with coffee, I would I'd want to get to know what they're passionate about, how to encourage that, and what, what's been painful in their life and how God can weaponize that for good. So good. So good. And, and as we come into land, Pastor Levi, how can we, there'll be viewers watching this being like, gosh, how do I find out more about Pastor Levi's ministry? I mean, you, you've written so many great books. One of them, Swipe Right. This, is, this has been so helpful, I think, for a generation when it comes to uh, discussing relationships, dating, sex, a lot of the taboo subjects that we don't always 
here uh, in pulpits on a Sunday. Uh, that's one aspect of what you do. But, but tell us how to find you <laughs> in a non creed Yeah, I mean, uh, our, all of our teachings are on YouTube, Fresh Life Church on YouTube. Um, we're really excited as a family. Um, one week from tomorrow, my wife's releasing her first book. So right. that's very exciting. It's called The Fight to Flourish wow. it's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. So that's coming out. And uh, yeah, just all the usual channels, Instagram and all that stuff. Amazing. And uh, we would count it a privilege if you would just pray a blessing over our viewers uh, as, we, as we end today's conversation. I'd love to. Jesus, thank you so much for every single person watching this. Thank you for um, the fact that this day that, that you saw in advance during the worst day of the world, the flood, you saw this day coming and you had a plan for it. And you're not alarmed or distressed by what the world's facing today. And so we can rest in that. And we thank you that we have the, the promise of peace, not peace from our trials, peace in the midst of our trials yes. as we cast our cares on you. And so I do pray for everybody watching this right now, just for a sense of calm in their hearts, uh, to use slogan from the blitz, that we could keep calm and carry on, that we could stand firm and not be frightened, but find joy and beauty in the smallest thing like a cup of tea or the sound of a bird outside of a window or uh, during a, a moment of peace, taking a walk when we're allowed to leave our home for a little respite. I pray that we would find tranquility, especially tranquility away from TVs and phones and computers where we can do what your word says and be still and know that you are God. I pray that we would do a better job of listening to your whisper and developing uh, the secrets, the secrets of the Lord that are with those who fear him. So I pray, Father, that as we learn to cultivate our fear of you, our holy sense of awe before you, that you would truly impart to us secrets that would give us strength as we live. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Levi. Well, I hope you uh, stay safe and stay sane in the midst of lockdown. Uh, and we'll speak to you again. Okay. God bless you, bro. Pleasure to talk to you.